Hi everyone, I hope that you are all doing well and enjoying the spring weather. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Thanks to everyone for bringing it to my attention that the due dates on the midterm and the final are about a week off. Uh, I apologize for that and I've adjusted the due dates accordingly. I, I posted an announcement and edited the, edited the course assignments to reflect the changes. I also attached the assignment details to each assignment in case people did not see the announcement with the links in them. I apologize because I'm learning as we go too. Uh, and I thank you all for your understanding and patience. By now, everyone should have at least 15 points in their grades. If you do not have 15 points, this means you may be missing posts. Everyone is expected to have a total of three posts for each week. I also added um, a burning questions discussion board. Please feel free to drop in any questions that you have about public library service that may not have been answered here or in any of your other classes. Um, I think that because we're doing this virtually, it makes it a little difficult to have that discourse. So I wanted to give you all that opportunity as well. I will try my best to answer any of these questions based on my experiences or the experiences of my colleagues and my general knowledge. As I read through your post, I saw a broad range of emotions reflected in your responses, uh, which included sadness, um, anger, and disgust. Uh, but there was consensus on the following. The perspective of the Rosenblum opinion piece is one of privileges, privilege, um, and it had held fallacies that only reflected the author's experience. Um, another thing, uh, people generally do not understand what it is that librarians do or the full scope of services that libraries provide. Uh, the web has not killed libraries, we can all agree to that, um, but ChatGPT might. And if you don't know what ChatGPT is, I would strongly advise you to take a look at that um, because that's another heavily discussed topic in the library world. And uh, I'd like to follow up on that discussion as well. Um, libraries should focus on the people who actually use our services. And if people were aware of the services that libraries provide, they would frequent libraries more. So those are the items of consensus. Um, this week we'll be discussing virtual services in the wake of COVID-19. We can all say that we have had the honor of surviving a pandemic that caused a shift in work culture. For example, more opportunities to work from home as well as employees being more willing to use their sick time, right? People now actively, as soon as they feel sick, they will take off from work. Um, so this week we're going to learn, we're going to lean into shared experiences because at this point our experiences have made us all experts. I will share my experience, which comes from the perspective of management. And I know a lot of times um, there's a disconnect between the decisions that management makes versus expectations of staff. Um, so I just want to give that other side of things. Uh, when the pandemic hit, I was working at Queens Public Library, and I remember hearing rumblings from staff about a potential closure. Uh, if you've ever had any experience in a public library system, you know that libraries rarely close. And this is because we are um, a primary service point for people in need. Uh, so we tend to stay open so that people have um, a place of respite or somewhere that they can go. Um, but with the pandemic, all bets were off, right? Uh, we officially closed on March 16th, but we were back online by March 18th, providing chat reference services. Uh, during that two day window, my colleagues and I had to one, determine which librarians had access to computers and the internet so that they could provide the online services, get all capable staff home access to our ILL because we had to be able to look into accounts and answer account questions. So 
it would be futile if we could, if we're doing chat to not have access to patron accounts. Um, create an equitable schedule for eight hours of chat reference. Build in online training modules so that everyone had eight hours of work that they could do at home. At the end of each week, staff had to submit all of their training they had done to their manager and our training and development team because we also counted those trainings to the renewal of their New York State licenses. Um, so if you're not familiar, librarians have to get continued education in order to get their certification as librarians. Um, both the state of Maryland and New York State are 60 credit hours and you have to submit that paperwork every five years so that you can maintain your license. We also had to get laptops for staff who did not have home computers. Um, and those who opted to, they got a QP, a Queens Public Library issued laptop that could remotely access their work desktops. This gave us access to our work drives. Um, so any folders that we had saved on our work drive and our intranet, which allowed us to look up policy and documents and forms and also the ILL again so that we could access patron accounts from home. As the pandemic continued, we further had to figure out virtual programming and how to train staff to conduct a program and our meetings virtually. Um, we had everyone take uh, virtual programming training because a lot of people did not know how to do these things. Um, our software of choice for Queens Public was WebEx uh, because we knew that Zoom was having some issues with privacy and access, things like that, that were complicated. So we opted over to WebEx, which they're all very, very similar in how they function. Um, we had to determine what to do about patrons' cards that were set to expire. Uh, we decided to automatically renew all cards and extend expirations. Um, we did put address holes in place for any card that was automatically renewed so that once we reopened, um, account holders could come in and they would have to verify their address. So we still... Um, maintained our protocol in terms of address verification for the renewal process to make sure that you still lived where you have documented. Um, we had to determine what to do about fines and build items because once items went into a build status and you exceeded a certain amount, I believe at that time it was about $500, um, you could not have access um, and that included digital access. So we had to figure out a means of allowing people to still have access because they could not come in to pay down their fines um, or return their build items. So what we did was we suspended all fines um, and we stopped collection collections proceedings. And that eventually led to the decision for um, Queens Public to be a fine-free institution. Uh, the use of digital library collections went through the roof and we issued e-cards, which are cards that are only that only allow you access to um, the databases and virtual items. Um, the school library journal did a survey in May of 2020 and about 30 percent of public libraries had shifted their entire spending priority to ebooks and digital content. Um, so now the return, right? Um, so we had to determine how to safely return staff to our buildings while maintaining social distancing and then still providing service for our customers that was safe for everyone. Um, so what we did was we created alternate schedules where staff worked on an A, B, C rotation um, and they alternated weekly. This way, and if anyone got sick, on an entire team would be able to quarantine because we'd call in the next team. Um, and while on site, they could socially distance. So we built out the teams based on how many service points we had 
and how um, how many desks we had and how many people could be six feet apart and still work in the space comfortably. Uh, we also started staggered branch operation. So uh, the branches, uh, Queens had 62 branches and the branches opened strategically throughout Queens with Central being the last location to open for public service because we were a warehouse. So we had all of the PPE, we had the backlog of um, new materials that had been shipped in um, for distribution to the branches during the pandemic. And we had to come in and um, deal with all, like distributing the PPE as well as um, setting up our collection um, for social distancing and then um, distributing all of the books to the branches um and we had to figure all of that out to make sure again that everyone was safe um sir, sidewalk service became a real operational model and prior to the pandemic i don't believe that a lot of libraries um used sidewalk quote unquote sidewalk service um and so sidewalk service is basically contactless, right? Um, people will create holds in your system and then they will come in and pick their items up. Um, and we have automated machines for checkout. So they use the self-checkouts. Uh, there was no interaction between the patron and staff. Uh, if you had a question, um, people could uh, ask questions of the circulation staff at a safe distance, um, but we also had to minimize how long people were actually in the location. So if it was not a quick question that could be answered on the spot, we advised you to use the chat services so that we could get other people in the building and um, keep the flow of traffic and make sure that everyone was safe. Um, there was no browsing of the collection, and this resulted in the circulation statistics for collections that were usually browsed to be lower. So, for example, your circulation in children's was lower because usually that's a very visual collection. People come in, they like to look at that, and they'll pull based on just the optics of, of they don't necessarily come in with a predetermined item. Um, not always, right? The library provided um, all PP PPE for staff to ensure that they were safe and comfortable. This um, included gloves, hand sanitizer, masks, everything that staff needed. And we provided those items to patrons as well. We also had to work out a system for quarantining the books um, before we actually processed them. And I think QPL is fortunate because most of our um, book drops are automated so they come in through a conveyor and they get sorted on the conveyor so once they got sorted on the conveyor um they would be placed in bins um and then we would no human would make contact with those items for five days um patrons were only permitted to return via those automated book returns and thankfully our sorting room was um large enough to maintain the capacity of that space um and the circulation staff would placed uh would place labels that read the return date and the date to be processed so everyone knew when those items could be um, processed and shelved, et cetera. Um, thankfully, neither Queens Public Library or Enoch Pratt had to lay off staff, but they did have significant churns. So I know for a fact that both institutions had significant churn because I'm a direct product of that churn, right? Um, one person I know um, moved all the way to Alaska, and then for myself, I moved to Maryland. Uh, I can say that there was always a feeling from staff that management wasn't doing the most that could be done for them. Um, and when people came to me with their concerns, I definitely tried to hear them. Um, 
but I know that from my perspective, we had to strike a really delicate balance. The people affected most by the pandemic still needed us to be there for them. So that's the unhoused, um, that's people on the lower end of the economic scale. Um, so we had to provide some level of service and we also had to be fiscally responsible with how we were providing service how we were ordering our ppe and our hand sanitizer um and it was very very delicate uh, i can tell you that we had long meetings and we struggled with every decision that we made you know i can't say that everything we did was perfect um, because we were all learning together. No one had ever been through this experience. There was no guidebook. So that's a good segue into the next topic. Uh, what can we say we've learned from these past two years of providing virtual public library services during a pandemic? Well, I know that in both institutions, digital services have become a cornerstone of library service Patrons have been become more connected to ebooks and other digital services, online databases, social media, etc. Um, hybrid and virtual programming has evolved as another lay of service, and now we offer many, many programs as hybrid programs, even though people are coming back into our buildings. Um, because we see that it actually benefits everyone and it increases accessibility, which is a driving factor behind everything that we do. <clears throat> um, it benefits our patrons who can't always make it in person for whatever reason, whether they have a disability or they just can't get in their car and, and make it on a given day. Um, and, you know, with that being said, I look forward to hearing what your experiences have been uh, during the pandemic and, you know, post-pandemic post uh, as we return to work. You know, how do you feel about the decisions that have been made in the library systems, either that you frequent or that you work for? Remember um, that I changed the date for the virtual services evaluation paper that is now going to be due on Sunday, May 7th by midnight. Um, there are no discussion posts due for week five, um, and I'm also going to make week five available for viewing at midnight tonight as well. Um, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or post them on the discussion board. Um, and I'm going to try to make these next two weeks as low maintenance for y'all as possible. And uh, that's the end of the lecture. Everyone enjoy your week.